St. John's is a squalid residential building at 651 Southern Boulevard in the South Bronx, near a stretch known to law enforcement officers as the Westchester Strip. Outside the building, four lookouts walk. Others perch on nearby fire escapes while two runners steer the streets. The thick metal door to a first-floor apartment, 1C, is framed with cement, sending a familiar message to the people who occupy the building, you don't pause here unless you want some. Behind the hole in the door stands a pitcher, who hands out glassines. Red, yellow, and green bulbs flash him instructions from a homemade panel nailed to the floor. Upstairs, in another apartment, the dealer works. He places the tiny bags of heroin in the dumbwaiter and sends them downstairs. The pitcher has no way out of the first floor apartment but up. Sheet metal, pipes, bars barricade all windows. Listen closely as boy George briefs the novice pitcher, he's certain to explain, but he won't speak loud and he'll say it once. If I look out the window and I could see a cop, I give it the yellow switch. You see it, and you slow down. If there is no movement in the upstairs apartment, no signals coming, you know something's up and you bum rush. Bum rush. If I hit the red switch, pack everything up, get in the dumbwaiter, and go. Green's green dude. The material come down and the money go up. That's all you need to know, ready? Breakfast or lunch or dinner. Send a runner for a hero and one of those big, big cokes. At your service, right down to the food. There can be no skimming of the product because there is no conversation because there are no phones. It is very organized. The lookout signal to the dealer, a raised baseball hat, a touch to the face, and the dealer hits the appropriate switch, translating his instructions into color. The pitcher responds to light drop after drop, only knowing how much heroin to deliver, the steerer just knows how much he takes in, the exact amount to be offered up. At the end of the 80s, while America concerned itself with the consequences of crack, and crack dealers continued in that hyper trade, Boy George was running five heroin locations in the South Bronx, including 139th and Brook, one of the oldest and more profitable heroin venues in the borough. Whoever acts gets the prize, experience taught Boy George that. And the more severe the action, the better the prize. According to federal prosecutors Henry de Pippo and Patrick Fitzgerald, by the time he turned 18 Boy George was a dealer of the Major League. In late 1988, when he was 20 years old, Boy George was the primary source of heroin in the South Bronx, employing more than 50 workers and grossing about a quarter of a million dollars a week. The brand name of this teenager's heroin was Obsession. The logo on its little bags was a Red King's crown. Although he was an accomplished businessman, manipulating forms of threat and people's fears, Boy George remained a child. Personality was his certain gift, impudent, streetwise, disarming, as cautious as he was searching, Boy George was charming. And mean. He always was a tough boy, but he earned his way to living large, expensive toys and outrageous risks and an entourage of eager, less well-equipped kids. Government documents describe the estate he bought in Puerto Rico, with $140,000 in cash, and the stable of cars he kept in America, BMWs, Porsches, and Mercedes-Benzes. He customized his favorites with $12,000 ostrich skin interiors, 630-watt stereos, 10-track CD players, televisions with VCRs, cellular phones. Several were worthy of James Bond, whom George revered, rear license plates that slid into side compartments and exposed blinding beams of light, secret compartments for guns. One Mercedes 190E released gobs of oil from its tail, another, large nail-like tacks. Boy George's business, which he called Tuxedo Enterprises, positioned him at a height from which he could only fall hard. I have to be in a place where I can manipulate the market, he explained from the Metropolitan Correctional Center, where he spent much of last year in segregation, for threatening to kill former employees' families and for the discovery of a hit list, in his handwriting, that included the two prosecutors and the federal judge involved in his case. That's my goal, he says, that's what I am, a manipulator. And when it says manipulator in the dictionary, it says, see American. And so, on this October day in 1990, halfway through the three-month trial that will end in his being sentenced to life in prison with no option for parole, Boy George continues with his dreams at the age of 23. When he is not preparing for his trial, Boy George studies shorthand in order to keep his note-taking of the court proceedings up to speed.
When he's not doing that, he reads the Bible, I can take arguments out of there, he says. Otherwise, he relaxes with yachting magazine. He redesigns his favorites, the 200-footers, the luxury yachts. Cousins to their decks, he customizes. I get a scrap paper, he says, grinning, and I draw. Now, in the dank visiting room, a mouse scurrying on the floor beside him, he shadow boxes. He speaks proudly about training with Hector Roker of Brooklyn's Glissons Gym before his May 1989 arrest. Boy George still says he will someday beat Tyson. Now, in his baggy orange suit, he sits solid in the chair, scrubbed face, new leather high tops, steady eyes. You can't read about it in books, and you can't look at it in the movies, he says, explaining his ambition. I was born with something inside of me that says, George, that's a pretty girl. Go and get her. George, that's a pretty suit, go and get that suit. George, this is something out here, it's for you. He enunciates the words spoken to him by his inner voice. We don't know exactly how long you'll have it, or how wide a span it'll get, but you could get it and all you gotta do is just put your mind to it. Don't think of nothing else. And ask about it, think about it, think with it, act like if you were it and change the shoes around like it was you. And then you'll see. He starts to box in slow motion, his words like incantation now, ah, he wants to come at me this way, but what if I go that way? He ducks, shadow jabbing. Come on and do it this way, he says, well, let's go that way. Boy George dodges. And when you get a feel that you're almost that thing, you reach out and grab it and it's yours. You have to have a lot of sleepless nights, but lord behold, it'll paint a picture. Back up to the summer of 1985, when George Rivera has just become Boy George. He is 17 years old, sleeping on Bronx Park benches. He brushes his teeth and rinses his light brown face in the dribble of fire hydrants. He has always been meticulous about his appearance, and within this control lies one of two emerging maxims. The first is that power grows in proportion to what you make other people see. The second is that people's most firmly rooted perceptions are based in fear. What is visible of his life just now would inspire fear in many people, derelict blocks of ghetto, a summer morning, urban heat, a Puerto Rican boy standing on a porch that reeks of piss and funk, two black dealers right beside him, watchful, quiet, still. Washington and 166th is easily one of the South Bronx's most dangerous locations. Rusted stoves jut out of broken windows, scrap yards interrupt lot after lot of garbage rot. George arches his thin chest off the wall. Already it is an ancient gesture, but it has a residue of boyish pride, he's just been promoted from lookout. He lopes toward a slowing car and moves his head side to side as if underwater, left right left back left, then down smooth to the shoulder. George takes the money. He heads into the dingy hallway and a minute later comes back out, then he's done. He steps back up on the porch and another dealer's already out to the next car, the third dealer moves across the street where junkies lurch toward him on foot. In this square neighborhood the only other businesses, besides narcotics, are run by tired men in crumbling caves, stray mattress shops, where soiled mattresses are hocked, then re and auto parts shops, the same, but with cars. The sounds are a mix of infants, gunshots, the reverberating shouts of radar, the day's code word for undercovers, and singing. The last comes sounding out from the storefront churches, the voices of grandmothers and still young enough children. Move up one year to the spring of 1986, nothing on 166th and Washington has changed. Except the teenager standing on the porch. Now boy George pulls up in his new white Mercedes Benz. He wears clean Levi's, a pressed isod, a sweater, beside him sits a pretty girl. He is a manager now. The Torres brothers allow him to collect their money counted, pack it, do payroll, drop it and to supply their dealers with Blue Thunder, the brand of which boy George is partially in charge. He hires employees, some triple his age. If I can trust you, I can kill you, he will say. And he'll also say that he hires individuals, not hoodlums, not freaks, not bums. These uncles and ex-cab drivers and teenage sons of ex-cab drivers open the spots by 9, 0 a.m. and run them through to the next morning. If the dealers or runners or lookouts or steerers need weapons, need assistance, if they need to talk to someone at any time, they beat boy George. He shows up instantly. 
if he beats them, coding in his 666, they call him back immediately. Workers are not to leave their spots to go to City Island to eat or to the movies or to White Castle, or to fuck no fucking girls, or go standing, blase, blase, blase with their crew. If the spots aren't fed and they don't got no reason why, if there is any problem, he will confront them once. And if a customer or dealer has a complaint as to the quality of Blue Thunder, Boy George delivers. If this isn't good you give it back equals to me and I get it back and I give you something fresh. Done. I don't like to not have the answers. I don't like the I don't knows. Excuses are for assholes. Everybody has one. Just set me up right, don't trick me. Louis Guzman, his name has been changed, a South Bronx legend, gave George his street name around this time. It was a joke. It stuck, boy George says. It's nice, it's different. It's not like calling somebody Chino, or calling them Red or Lefty, or Fingers. When you say Boy George you're talking about the singer or you're talking about me. That it was Louis Guzman who provided him with a new identity must have meant a lot to George. Years earlier, when Louis was pitching heroin in an empty lot George was afraid to walk by him on his way to elementary school. To have been christened by Guzman, Boy George thought in his childish willfulness, was an omen and a good one. The obsession organization, Boy George ran other brands named Candyland, Delirious, and Sledgehammer, leased a pool of 10 luxury cars from OJ's car service in Queens. The drivers, all men, could be paid up to $100 an hour to remain on call. It was at OJ's that Boy George met Ward Johnson, an older Jamaican hustler better known as 6-0. 6-0 became Boy George's first lieutenant, and when the obsession operation fell, 6-0 would become the prosecution's primary cooperating witness. 6-0's testimony fleshed out the internal workings of Tuxedo Enterprises and freed his own son from the consequences of his involvement. 6-0 himself pleaded guilty to a grab bag of charges, conspiracy to distribute heroin, using and carrying firearms in relation to narcotics, possession of 10.46 kilograms of heroin, evading taxes on $491,550 in income in 1988, but he is yet to be sentenced and recently testified in another obsession trial. Tuxedo Enterprises originated with boy George cutting and bagging heroin at the kitchen table of his Bronx apartment with 6-0, a kid named Weasel, and their girlfriends. Weasel was from the neighborhood. Weasel rarely lifted his head or his eyes but he was malleable and seemed eager to please. The product sold well and George rented another apartment as a mill. He revived the Obsession brand name by making it his own, its original managers, conveniently, were dead. Boy George would buy units of heroin, usually about 700 grams from his Chinese suppliers, whom he privately referred to as fried rice, and pass them along to 6-0, who would store them and distribute them to the cutting mills. At the various mills, South Bronx walk-up and project apartments and some hotel rooms in Manhattan and New Jersey, the food was cut, diluted and packaged in pre-stamped dime bags for retail sale. As much as its distributors and customers savor its purity and smell, heroin is not a product anyone keeps around. When everything runs exactly as it should, it takes less than 72 hours for the drug to make its way from the distributor to a customer's nostrils or veins. Since time can be lost setting up mills and orchestrating distribution strategy, all workers must remain on call, hence the beeper. Boy George's mill workers were girlfriends of his male associates and their friends, who often became girlfriends themselves, and it was their job to cut the heroin with man night, weigh it, and bag it in the pre-stamped glassines, each with its red crown logo. They would then take the glassines and package them in bundles in counts of ten. Five bundles, wrapped in newspaper, made a brick. One former mill worker, now serving eleven years with no parole for conspiracy, said they sometimes snorted coke to stay awake through the long shifts. Older women, often the mothers or grandmothers of workers, could stamp the bags with the Obsession logo from their own project apartments, while they babysat the children. When all the glassines were gone, the location manager would beat Weasel or Ralphie and they would take a driver from OJ's to pick up the money and bring it to 6-0, who recorded the transactions and did the payroll. 6-0 kept very good records. Location managers generally made 10 to 20% of the profit, depending upon the location, and were responsible for paying the lookouts, steerers, pitchers, and runners out of their share. 
Weasel and Ralphie, who also became a cooperating witness, earned $2,500 a week, 6 o made $12,000. Women filled the lower ranks of the operation, 4 12, 15, sometimes 20-hour shifts, they usually received $100. Boy George made roughly $45,000 a week. In April 1988, on the first anniversary of his empire's founding, Boy George set up a deal with a man named Tony, a jobber. Tony introduced Boy George to Sinbad, to whom Boy George handed over $600,000 in cash. Sinbad stepped into a duplex and left through a rear exit with the money. Boy George had not cased the meeting point himself, but the problem was his. For several hours, Tony was beaten by George and others, then taken to the Henry Hudson Parkway, near 86th Street, where Boy George shot him four times at close range. According to court papers, George then retained Juan Diaz, aka Tsong, to track Sinbad down, while he paid off his Asian source with $600,000 of his own. George's quick response to the slip-up reinforced his relationship with the Asian connection and strengthened his reputation on the streets. By the end of May, Sinbad was dead and Song earned a full-time place as a son of Bouncer. Court papers state that for $1,000 a week he kept discipline within the obsession operation. Here boy George brief him. Don't fall for the tricks about, oh, I too see you tomorrow blase blase blase, when you are dealing with someone who owes me money. You say, listen homie, I want to eat today. So I'm not going to wait to tomorrow to eat. I want to eat right now. I want to eat today, I'm hungry. Pay up dude. That's it. At George's behest zone killed a man named Todd Crawford in the parking lot of the King Lobster restaurant that June. In November, boy George arranged to have Tsong meet Yvette Padilla in Ferry Point Park. Yvette had been accused of stealing a gold and diamond scripted obsession belt buckle from Ice, the supervisor of George's Sledgehammer brand, whose real name is Walter David Cook. According to prosecutors, Tsong shot Yvette, then, say obsession employees, he dumped her body off the Triborough Bridge. Tsong received a few vials of crack, a $5,000 cash bonus, and an invitation to the Christmas party. On Christmas Eve, 1988, the Riverander stood waiting for Boy George at World Yacht's 23rd Street Dock. When he arrived at 7 p.m., everyone was clapping, and then they all boarded the ship. According to the captain's report, at 10.00 p.m. we left dock for a two-hour cruise that was quite memorable. Cruising out into the New York Harbor, 150 teenagers in black tie. My brother threw some good parties, says George's younger brother, Indio, but this one was kicking. In other words, it was live. Big Daddy Kane accepted $12,000 in cash for his 15-minute rap. Sapphire pocketed $3,000 without even performing, she refused to sing for the originally agreed upon $7,500 because she didn't have a private dressing room. The menu included steak tartare, skewered lamb, bocconcini, prime rib, $12,000 worth of champagne. There were raffle prizes, winners to be announced by the host, first prize a loaded Mitsubishi, second, $20,000 in cash. Home entertainment centers, a Macy's gift certificate, a trip to Disneyland, a night on the town. According to the captain's report, nobody bothered to claim the $100 and $200 prizes. Everyone who had done anything was there. 60 received a gold Rolex and $50,000 in cash, Ice was given a brand new model 750 BMW. George also gave diamond inscribed gold obsession belt buckles, appraised at $7,500 each, to four of his other top men. There were fights and there was flirting. One guest challenged a drunken dealer, perched midway on the tip of the ship's bow, to swim ashore, he didn't. Another guest was stripped down to his underwear and left on the deck after a group beating, he'd allegedly attempted to steal a young woman's diamond pendant. The seating arrangement was carefully planned, by location. There were lots of pictures taken, guys leaning forward, toasting, bloodshot eyes, abundant tables, groups of girls in off-the-shoulder taffeta swirls. It was a prom, open bar, no chaperones. Boy George paid for the tuxedo rentals, for everything. His bill from World Yacht alone ran to more than $30,000 and he paid for it all in cash, the guests didn't pay a thing. All paid dearly for the pictures later, though, when federal prosecutors pinned in large reproductions of them on the courtroom bulletin boards for the judge and jury to see. Giddy Hard earned glory boasting on the water. 
Image after image of fearlessness, of tired eyes, of youth. And like a little boy, boy George had a Christmas wish, a half hour before the ship docked, he asked if he could visit the captain, and up he went. It was a rare moment of parity, where life reflected and respected boy George's vision of his rightful self. Boy George's first childhood memory is of taking a bath in the kitchen sink and getting burned with hot water. His next is of looking out his apartment window and seeing a cat get hit by a car in front of his Tremorne Avenue tenement. He remembers crying for the dead cat. He didn't have friends. We were always moving around, he says. I loved pets. I tried to keep dogs, but they were always getting hit too. Indio learned a lot from George. How to carry yourself, how to be careful, he would always say to me, choose what you want in life. You got to be serious when you do things. You have to stop being a little faggot boy. He showed me how to read. Look, you don't know the words. Break it down. Indio's earnest face carries the family legacy of bruised affection. My mother is a heartbroken person. My own heart gets broken quick. But when it comes to heartbreaking matter, George knows how to deal with it professionally. He was the bravest in the family. He was the one who had the balls. George's father left when George was six months old and the boy would visit him whenever he could, sometimes there were ye-long gaps. I think he's very bright, says George Rivera Sr., 46, a suspicious, handsome man who now owns a car service in Queens. He used to turn things. In my mind I said, this kid, he has something coming. George's relationship with his mother, Montserrat, 39, had always been tense. In court papers, George claims she beat him and Indio, regularly and badly, a charge Indio confirms, George remembers her using an extension cord. The brothers also say that she was overly possessive of them, especially when it came to girls. George ran away when he was 10, his life was his business. His mother eventually received a pins, parent with a child in need of supervision order from the court when George was 12. Soon after, he was sent to the Pleasantville Diagnostic Center, where he spent three months, then to St. Cabrini's, a group home in New Rochelle, where he was the youngest boy. The eight Cabrini kids all lived together in a one-family, brick front corner home with four bedrooms, a lawn, fruit trees, skunks and raccoons. The house was in the transitional part of town, where the working class spilled into the upper middle and then onto the rich. The Cabrini kids attended the local junior high and high schools. They felt the normal pressure to assimilate, but, since all of them were poor, most of them withdrew from the New Rochelle kids instead. George was the only Puerto Rican on the new Rochelle high football team. To play, he had to quit his nighttime job stocking shelves at a nearby shop well. He got invited to the rich kids' parties, the girls' houses on the hill. According to Ul Bowman, his counselor at the home, George dragged his Cabrini friends along. After one party, George and two friends made away with the host family's silverware and he convinced his crew to take their talent to the surrounding sprawling homes. The police caught up with George at the local pawn shop. According to Bowman, George took the rap for his crew and was sentenced to 13 months at Valhalla, a juvenile detention center upstate. What the Cabrini director of group homes, William Jones, remembers best, after 28 years of throwaway city children, it is striking that he remembers George at all, is George's loyalty. A lot of the Spanish kids hang out with the black kids in the homes, but when they get around the white kids, they act like they don't know them at all. George never forgot that his friends were his friends. George says that Cabrini made him into a man. At home, he says, you can't spread out the way you could around different people. When you're home with your moms and stuff it's you and your mom and your brother, that's it. I had a chance to spread out, wide, wide angle, like a wide angle lens. I got hip to everything that I would need to get hip to and I started analyzing and analyzing. Another mentor of George's was a man named Holland Randolph, who is now a supervisor at the Episcopal Mission in Manhattan. Randolph had just gotten the job at Cabrini's, and on his first Sunday night of duty George showed him the ropes. While boy George was still a resident he offered to lend the drug counselor $2,000, but Randolph says he never got the loan. He was going to loan me money at some point in some regard, but I lost contact, says the counselor. Randolph distinctly remembers one of George's return visits, it was Randolph's birthday and George took him out to eat in New Rochelle. 
they drove to the restaurant in a brand new Mercedes. He really pulled out the carpet, says Randolph, so to speak. He was a flashy guy. He had class, unfortunately, the wrong kind of class. He knew how to present himself to talk to people of a higher stature and knew when people were playing a con game on him. George kept in touch with Ul Bowman, too. He never called asking for money, and those were rough times, says Bowman. But he was floundering. It was in the things he asked for. It would be this way, can you get me a gun? Things like that. He was into petty stuff. Then finally he hooked into something, and from there well. You watch someone you care for get caught up in a whirlwind and all you can do is say, take care, man. Insulate yourself. Boy George did his best, he employed childhood friends, friends of friends, family, recruited Cabrini alums. His workers owned safety grew in proportion to the perception of his retaliatory powers, and he earned a vicious reputation and gave obsession fine PR, lieutenants and managers received gold belt buckles with their names scripted in diamonds, top dealers received red and white leather baseball jackets WNH, CCCP, written on the back. The ornaments protected his workers and ranked them, publicly, in the order of their importance to the organization and in their proximity to him. A wise incentive program, and an investigator's dream. At the beginning of 1989, Boy George purchased more real estate in Puerto Rico and, with the help of a financial consultant, looked into the possibility of opening a fast food mall with a McDonald's and a Pizza Hut and a church's fried chicken. He also began to transform the Puerto Rico estate into a permanent home. Wiretaps placed by the New York Drug Enforcement Task Force, NIDEF offer detailed discussions about the renovations, which were overseen by Blanca Marti, his girlfriend who stayed at the estate with their sons, Giovanni Lord and Chris Rivera. Workmen installed electronic security gates and paved a basketball court. George had obsession inscribed in tile on the bottom of his swimming pool, alongside the initials, BG. The inscription may have been done in a moment of indulgence, or it may have been a young boy's success signal, reaching up to the Puerto Rico gods. Sanford Katz, a veteran public defender who represented one of George's street managers, thinks differently, if you want to advertise IAEM a drug dealer, he says, then bring a Porsche into the South Bronx. You'll have every investigator and snitch paying attention. Boy George did and they were. But to have the logo of his brand of heroin, which can be found all over the Bronx, on the bottom of his swimming pool? That was very Abby Hoffman-esque. He was saying, fuck you, to the world. The expensive objects George flaunted surely said at least that to the poor streets that produced him. As did the dead competitors and colleagues planted as warnings each step a long way. From the crying Puerto Rican kid in the tenement window, boy George, only 21, had drastically upped his threshold for pain. According to government evidence, in 1986, while he was still working for the Torres brothers, George shot one competitive associate and injected another with heroin. Like most top-level dealers, the man did not use drugs. In 1987, after sharing an extravagant shrimp scampi dinner, he shot his dining companion and dumped his body off a bridge. The victim had disrespected Boy George to a friend, whose sister, unbeknownst to the victim, Boy George was dating. From then on, whenever a colleague or competitor needed that kind of taking care of, it was referred to as eating shrimp or being taken out for shrimp. Eventually, the phrase became an in-house obsession joke. That same summer, 166th and Washington became a wanted spot. George organized an ambush to clean out the competition and, at the end of the shooting, an uninvolved bystander was dead. A September 4, 1990, letter filed by the prosecution briefly notes another murder, this one of an unnamed man, an incidental three-sentence episode in a long list of violent acts that never made it to the jury. The encounter best reveals the blind spot where George's boyhood and ego crossed. That day, boy George had a routine meeting with a higher-up and pulled his new Mercedes-Benz off the FDR to wait. A drunk driver bumped into his car and didn't stop, so boy George followed him and forced him off the road. He then stabbed the man a number of times, leaving him for dead in the front seat of his car. It didn't make any difference to George if the driver was dead or not, he'd done what he did. This blindness, most obviously to the worth of a human life, marked the intersection of boyhood and ego that would result in the loss of boy George's freedom for the rest of his life. 
that he lacked a finely tuned sense of the larger balance, that people existed beyond their utility and ability to service him, that people, in effect, have a right to their own time, is a failing common among men, but one to which children might be temporarily entitled. The grace period of a liberal arts education might have modulated his need, just as an outstanding mentor may have tempered his arrogance, but it's not likely. His view of the world, like a child's, remained two-dimensional. The most significant dichotomy, before the money and after, was the most encompassing and intense. Before the money, life was the only thing. After, it could be carelessly flaunted or thrown away. Before, he trusted nobody, because he thought anyone could hurt him. After, he thought he was so powerful that nobody could. And while Boy George worked his way through the chaos of his increasingly complex future, with guns and the other dangerous tools of his trade, the par snuck up from behind, an accumulation of two years of behaving like an extremely arrogant and savvy and talented unsophisticated kingpin kid. Back in August 1987, Boy George had met Louis Guzman outside the Baychester diner. Louis had a connect. Proud of finally being considered the older dealer's real peer, Boy George went to the meeting himself. He was especially impressed with Lewis by then because he fully appreciated the accomplishments of the life. Street years are like dog years and Lewis dodged raps better than anyone. At Lewis's encouragement, Boy George sold two ounces of rock heroin to an unfamiliar man. He also bragged that his business grossed $250,000 a week, discussed his estate renovations, bemoaned the difficulty of shipping cars to Puerto Rico, flashed his diamond Rolex, and accepted $12,000 in cash. Days alter his meeting with Lewis, Mount Vernon detectives knocked on the door of the apartment George kept for Blanca and her mother at 156th Street. The police were looking for George on an outstanding bench warrant for gun possession. George allegedly fled out a fourth-floor window, and Blanca's brother wouldn't talk. On their way out, the policeman noted a 1987 Mercedes on the impoverished street and started asking questions. Spooked, boy George arranged for 6-0 to move the hot car. Just to be careful, he also told him to fold the cutting mill on East 213th Street and to set up shop at the Midtown Marriott Marquis Hotel. As an afterthought, George told his mother to stop by 213th Street for a final double check. The Mount Vernon detectives had tracked the Mercedes, New York plates PZY148, to 6O's family home on Prospect Street in Yonkers. 6O kept several other apartments with other girlfriends at a weekly cost of $1,000 each. 6O spoke to the detectives, he said that he had received a call from George on August 30 to pick up the car on 520 East 156th Street and that he worked for George. The cops moved on to 213th Street and, believing George was inside the apartment and possibly armed, made a forcible entry. 6O had made a sloppy departure, inside, in plain view, the cops found quinine, razor blades, white powder covering a table, glassine envelopes, and scales. A search uncovered shotgun shells, .38 caliber shells, 9mm shells, rifle shells, a rifle with a scope, three shotguns, a tranquilizer gun, a bulletproof vest, three bags containing large amounts of cash and drugs, and other boxes of ammunition. According to the detective's report, George's mother, Montserrat, then arrived in a hysterical manner, inquiring as to what happened to her son. She said she'd last seen him on August 21. Then, distraught, terrified, or perhaps even vengeful, Montserrat began to talk, Blanca Marty made her son into a dealer. Blanca took out a student loan and set George up with the money. Her own Mother's Day gift from her son, $5,000 in cash, he took back to buy more drugs and it was Blanca's fault. George had $125,000 stashed at Blanca's house, too, and he always carried a gun since he got heavy into drugs. The Mount Vernon detectives alerted the 47th precinct, and the drug task force sent their people in. Meanwhile, the Midtown Marriott became a dorm. 6O arrived with boxes of glassines, scales, and a silencer, as the shifts of mill workers were beeped in. It sounds fucked up, says one convicted mill worker, but if George wasn't around, it was a lot of fun sometimes. It was like you'd all be sitting there, like a family. Hunched over card tables, their surgical masks on, in for the underpaid shift. The jokes begin, hands move together, separate, and seal. Around this time, Boy George launched a new brand name, Delirious. 
It was the same cut as Obsession, but its blue logo, a crazed-looking man with a bulbous nose, spooked junkies. Within two months of the test market, Boy George shut down the line. He instructed the mill foreman to return production to Obsession full-time, believing that, for a change, it was best to play it safe. The same week, Boy George met Lewis and the undercover again. This time for lunch at Willie's Bar and Steakhouse, near the intersection of Westchester Avenue and Beach Street. George unloaded 600 leftover bags of Delirious and took $5,000 home. He'd promised to supply a grinder, the undercover told George he'd had a hard time grinding down the rock, but 6O warned George that the guy might be a cop, so George didn't return the connect calls to his beeper. The arrests and seizures continued for months, still unconnected. On September 20, 1988, 100 glassines of obsession were confiscated from the second-floor apartment at the St. John's location, along with $4,400 in cash. Two months, the NIDETF arrested a St. John's dealer, who was carrying 400 glassines of obsession. A steerer, Anthony Briggs, also led an undercover to a 10 glassine sale on January 5, 1989. Five days later, the same undercover bought 40 glassines from Briggs's brother at the same spot. While surveillance of the location increased, Boy George was discovering boxing. He became so enamored of the sport that he hired Hector Roker of Brooklyn's Glissons Gym to train him. Not counting traveling time, the workouts lasted a good four hours a day. The Briggs brothers benefited from George's lack of attention and were promoted to manage St. John's. They were arrested on February 8, just as they were passing $10,000 in cash between them in a brown paper bag. The NIDETF agents made their move into St. John's that same day, the first floor apartment yielded a loaded .22 caliber, a .357 revolver, a .38 caliber, and a .357 magnum inside a safe. During a search of the Briggs's East 165th Street apartment, St. John's Stash House, the agents discovered $50,000 in cash and 5,600 glassines. The mill had by then been moved to 740 East 243rd Street. The task force knew it, the investigators could also identify whom they believed to be the key players of the operation. On April 6, 1989, Boy George ran a yellow light and was stopped by two policemen. They wrote him up and confiscated his box, a common practice, according to South Bronx kids, then let him go. 6O later testified that Boy George often lost his beeper, that he'd get angry and drop it sometimes, too. But this time the carelessness eventually mattered, in a Bronx precinct office, Boy George's beeper, flashing phone number after phone number of his incoming business calls. On the two-year anniversary of Obsession's founding, at the same time a federal judge was granting investigators permission to place a 30-day wiretap on Boy George's Morris Avenue home phone, he moved to remedy the slip-ups, pull in the reins, and increase control. I gotta write my shit down somewhere secret and shit, I gotta code it up, he said to a friend, on April 5, 1989, the day before he was stopped for running the light, and less than a month before his arrest. Other phone conversations, which were eventually admitted into evidence, use Pig Latin as his teenage organization's attempt at communication in code. In the following, during a period when shipments of heroin were delayed, George discussed the possibility of opening crack locations with ICE. W. David Cook, I got plenty aper pay though. George Rivera, oh, I got plenty, but still I just don't wanna fuck around and one day starve and shit, that's not the thing about the aper pay it's just that, you know what I worry about the most man, the, the Oris days. Cook, yeah. Rivera, that's all I worry about cause them niggas there man if I catch them niggas making aper pay somewhere else, ah man, we're going to have a crucifixion out here. Cook, well. Rivera, that's all I worry about is them dickheads. Cook, I know what you mean, what if they Ellie say Aggies Bay in the Aughty Spay? Rivera, yep, you know what I'm a do, too, I'm a open up Aki J's man. Cook, Aki J's for what? Rivera, just for fucking emergency purposes, brother, you crazy? Right now, it would have been cleaning up, you dig what I'm saying oh, you know Calvin is gonna get hit with something. This would become the most incriminating telephone conversation, the jury reading, crucifixion, as evidence of Boy George's ruthlessness. But Boy George believes that it was Lewis, his childhood hero and, according to George and his defense lawyers, a confidential government informant, who did him irreparable damage. 
6O, whom one former girlfriend and mill worker claims boy George treated as a father, did at least as much. On April 30th, police officially established surveillance of the 243rd Street Mill. Late that morning, Weasel and Ralphie left the building, each carrying a white plastic bag, jumped in an OJ car, and rode off. Soon after, the driver was arrested, 13 bricks of heroin, 10,400 obsession glassines in tow. That afternoon, Weasel and Ralphie were arrested as they left the mill with another white plastic bag, 800 obsession glassines to add to the climbing total. Early in the morning of May 1st, at 2.35 am, investigators entered the building. 11 mill workers were apprehended, with, among other things, blocks of man night, eight boxes of empty glassine stamped with the obsession, sledgehammer, and delirious brand names, five grinding machines, and strainers. There were boxes of sealing tape and three triple beam scales. A ledger held attendance and payment records, complete with notes on workers who arrived late. And the police found the standard protections, face masks, 2.38S, a 20-gauge pump shotgun, an automatic shotgun, and a 9mm MP9 automatic rifle, better known as a street sweeper, all loaded and ready to go. Federal agents had been listening to Boy George's phone calls throughout the night. Earlier that evening, in a conversation with ICE, Boy George talked about, breaking out, of doing the Jimmy James, Brown, dot. At 11, 6 p.m., as key people were being hauled in, 6O called George and told him he couldn't find some of their workers, I came through Washington and them niggers is gone. Dennis, a manager, I called his house. See a lot of these people I can't get a hold to, man. At 8, 36 the next morning, hours after the mill had been cleaned out, 6O woke George with another call. I gotta see you right away, 6O said. Bad, bad news. He made arrangements to meet George under some nearby streetlights and advised him, when you come out bring some money with you to break out. Yeah, boy George says on the wiretap, and sighs. A half hour later he was under arrest. As he left his apartment building to meet 6O, he found close to 40 federal agents waiting. According to boy George, the feds drove him through Central Park on their way to Central Booking. As he looked out the window of the white Lincoln Mark IV, one of the agents pointed to a seedling. See that plant, the cop asked. It's gonna be a tree when you get out. 33 obsession workers had been arrested in the sweep. Of those, 24 pleaded guilty. In September 1990, Boy George went on trial on 14 counts, among them, conspiring to run a continuing criminal enterprise, also known as the Kingpin Charge, drug possession and distribution, as well as ownership of a page-long list of guns. He was found guilty of only two, ormpted tax evasion and conspiracy to distribute heroin. He told his mother and girlfriends not to come to the sentencing if they were going to cry, he did not want anyone associated with him to give the prosecution that satisfaction. He deliberated over what to wear and expected a crowd. When the date arrived, in the spring of 199, M the judge told George that he was one of the most violent people ever to set foot in her courtroom and that she had not, in the long days of the proceedings, seen any sign of regret or remorse. Boy George shook his head ruefully and smiled. Other than his family and a Newsday reporter, nobody showed for him. In the wake of the most recent South Bronx heroin busts, the same locations, another 30 workers, hawking the same brand of drug, stray obsession trials continue. Boy George works on his appeal, one obsession worker, who allegedly continued the drug operation under George's direction from jail, using the brand name Raw, recently pleaded guilty to lesser charges, Ice was recently convicted on 14 of 15 counts, and Song, the alleged hitman, is up in January. On the streets and in the same locations, the trade continues without pause. A month ago, things remained the same 35 at 139th Street and Brook Avenue in the South Bronx. Eight fist-size holes, waist level, punch through the corner building cement front wall. Imagine a moat surrounding the block-long building, that's where the steerers roam. They pivot and backhand fistfuls of cash into the holes. Arms stick out and pass glassines of heroin in return. At the rear of the building is a playground, an asset to the business, providing fine visibility and a labor pool. To have realized dreams as fierce as Boy George's required a hunger that was large. 
The coursing traffic before the 139th Street location today proves that his strategy of attaining his was accurate, a Coco Nissan, its white girl in waiting, her boyfriend having jumped out for the cop, one thin man pert in the driver's seat of a dented Monte Carlo, countless sorry-eyed old-timers and some college kids, car after idling car in rows three deep. And so boy George was a kingpin, among junkies, hustlers, children, feeding other people's fears.